super excited to kick off the creative quarantine with a panel that's highlighting women footwear designers. Oftentimes women are footnotes, no pun intended, or completely left out of the conversation when we're talking about streetwear and sneaker culture. But our ladies today are some designers behind some of your favorite sneakers and collaborations. So put some respect on it, okay? So let's introduce them. They're gonna tell you a little bit about themselves as well as sharing with you guys their favorite sneaker that they're wearing today. All right, so first up we have Victoria. She's a color and materials designer with Adidas. Hey, Victoria girl. Hey. Hey, so I'm good. How are you? Yes. Yeah, so I'm Victoria, Victoria Adesami from Maryland, DMV native. I am a color material designer at Adidas. And today I have on my Easy 500. Hey. Ain't mad with that. <laughs> Next up, we have Sarah. She handles global brands at Adidas. Hey, Sarah. Hello. How's it going? I'm Sarah. I was born and raised in Portland. Um, I'm a footwear designer at Adidas on the running team, and today I'm wearing my Rivalry Lows. That's classics. Lastly, but certainly not least, we have Kelsey. She's a footwear designer at Adidas. Hey, Kelsey. I'm Kelsey Fu. I'm originally from Bay Area, San Jose, and I'm currently living in Los Angeles, working as a footwear designer specifically for collabs on Yeezy products. And my go-to at the moment with being home for quarantine is the Yeezy Slides. Got to go with full comfort at home. Yes, I like that little 360 you did. <laughs> welcome, welcome, ladies. So we're going to kick off the conversation with a little lightning round, a little icebreaker to get you know your bones moving and voice talking and all that stuff. All right, so this first one is for Victoria. I'm going to like shout out two things. You just say the first thing that comes, the first thing you agree with, okay? So high tops or low tops? Low tops. Low tops? Yes. I love me a low top. <laughs> All, right, All right. So, Sarah, fresh face or fresh fit? Oh, I would say fresh fit. Always a fresh fit. Yeah. Kelsey, so what would you say is your favorite Adidas collab? I'd say right now is definitely the partnership with Kanye and how much he's pushing the industry for sure. Perfect. So this one is for all you guys. So what is your favorite Adidas shoe style? Ooh, that's hard. Well, my favorite Adidas shoes is the Oswego with the Ross Simmons. Mm -hmm. um, I love those shoes. Love them. I love metallic outsole, but I also love the forums. What about you, Sarah? Yeah, my favorite is probably the Rod Labor. It's like classic dad shoe, which has been around for forever, but I've loved it since I was like 12. So that's definitely my favorite. I'd say for me, probably some classic skate shoes like match courts. For me, it's something super easy to rock and, you know, the lows, mids or highs, easy to wear. For me, I would probably say the Stan Smith. I just feel like it goes with everything. It's just everything. Okay. All right. So let's get into these questions. We're going to start off with basics. I'm sure there are plenty of people out there that want to know what it takes to be a footwear designer, myself included. So what skills do you guys need or schooling did you take to be like a footwear and color materials designer? Like where did it all begin for you? So for me, I went to NC State, North Carolina in Raleigh and I studied industrial design and I actually thought I was gonna work in high fashion. Moved to New York and I wasn't the happiest and I took a class at FIT and um, my classmate actually told me about Pencil, which is the Footwear Design Academy in Portland. Had no idea, applied, got into the program, and I thought I wanted to be a footwear designer. And my professor and now mentor, Dwayne Edwards, was like, yo, you should look into doing color materials. And I was like, all right. And so Adidas actually had a class sponsored, and so that's actually how I got in my foot at Adidas. But I would say like, you know, learning programs like Photoshop and Illustrator, um, sketching or like doing mock-up. So that would be my suggestion. Um. Similar to Vic, actually, I really wanted to get into high fashion as well, but I wasn't sure really how to make that happen. And so I studied product design at University of Oregon. And while I was there, in the beginning, I ended up meeting a mentor who at the time was at Adidas and kind of introduced me to the world of footwear design. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. I didn't realize that like this could be a job. And so I tried to kind of do that on the side. And um, it really helped to have a mentor that I could show my sketches to, show my concepts to, um, in the meantime, studying product design, which is definitely a bit more broad. But um, yeah, the more I think you can hone in on your technical skills, um, once you get out into the workforce, you'll be able to learn um, some of the 
some of the specific footwear design process? Um, for me, similar to Sarah, actually, we both went to University of Oregon and studied product design, same class. So that's, it's been awesome to see us both grow in this industry. But I'd say for sure, like having a mentor reaching out and, you know, any internship that you see online, if it's something you really want to get into, it's something you start looking at, um, even if you're, you know, a freshman and it's only applying to seniors. I think just being aware of all the different opportunities and there's a lot of brands out there that want to hear from you know, a younger generation and hear what the next wave of trends is coming in. So they're really looking for input from those people. But for me, definitely doing multiple internships across different brands and just keeping in touch with mentors and checking in with people um, to develop those skills. All right. So this next question is for Sarah. How much do you pay attention to human movement when it comes to conceptualizing an idea? Um. I would say movement is honestly like the foundation for everything that we do, um, especially in running. It's interesting when you think about running, it's like in its simplest terms, it feels very like linear, linear motion. Um, but then when things like environment, so say um, trail running or city running get introduced, it totally changes the way that your foot and your body interacts with the ground in a shoe. So everything really starts with movement, to be honest. Um, and then we kind of filter that through different inspirational uh, sort of like mood filters, if that makes sense. But everything comes back to how the foot's moving, how it's affected um, when it's uh, performing those different movements. But it's definitely 360 movement at times, too. It's not just linear. Perfect. All right. So this next question is for everyone. We all know that designing a shoe takes a team effort, but where do you guys see yourselves fitting in the puzzle? So for me as a color, my color material designer, um, my job is basically to work and build color material palettes. And so thinking about how can I work with the designer to make sure if it's a technical shoe, is it breathable to the materials work? And the footwear designer, um, we're all briefed essentially by marketing. So it's like so many hands in the pot. And then you also have a developer who helps you bring your ideas to life. Yeah, so I think the whole process is super collaborative, but like Vic just touched on. Um, marketing handles the briefs, which are then handed over to design, who really works on um, bringing that idea to life. And that can manifest through um, like movements, like I just talked about, what movements are we addressing? Which problems are we solving? Um, and then what's our mood and inspiration? And then we work really closely with Vic and color materials designers um, to add color materials to the vision. Yeah, and I'd say for us, you know, it's, how we work on a day to day, it's like a sketch can come from here, a Photoshop can come from here, or a reference can come. And we kind of have to creatively think of a solution to get after the problem that we're being asked to solve. So, you know, you know, obviously we have a very full team of development, marketing, our, you know, mark our greater business side team. But it's also really great that within Adidas we have a maker lab. We have people that we can help create samples like super quick and show them an idea and a sketch. And then from there we're able to translate it and take things into a bit more of a technical aspect when we go to our like factory trips, for example. All right, so this next question is for you, Kelsey. We know that you guys deal with a lot of celebrities, entertainers, and athletes uh, at Adidas. So we want to know, what is the collabor collaboration process like at Adidas? How do designers bring a creator's vision to life? And what is the collaboration process like? Yeah, I'd say for each of the collaborations, it's really different, whether it is a celebrity or not. Um, Adidas is all about collaborating. So we can either bring in athletes that are, you know, younger athletes to professional athletes to music artists. And I think no matter who we're dealing with, it's really about listening to them, sitting and understanding what they're feeling, what they're envisioning for the future. And it can be, you know, a quick 30 second blur to a, a three hour speech sometimes. And, you know, you really have to just take into account everything they're feeling and figure out a way to translate into a product that lets them express themselves. So definitely a fun part of being, you know, in the collaborative process. I definitely can. I feel like that's just like so exciting to just hear so many different ideas from people you may look up to and then you can conceptualize that at, for yourself as a designer and then to see the finished product and they enjoy it. That's probably like amazing for you guys. Absolutely. Yeah. All 
All right, so this next question is for Victoria. We know you're a color and materials designer. So can you tell us about your role a little more in depth? What does working with various materials and how does it come into play? For you. Yeah, so a lot of it is based on seasonality. So if I'm building a material palette for spring, essentially, you know, I'm thinking about materials that are breathable and lightweight. If I'm, you know, designing for fall, winter, thinking about things that are a bit more heavier and thicker, right? And I think even as a color material designer, it's not just color materials, but taking a familiar icon and then seeing how we can reinterpret or remix it. So that way the details are updated and it still looks fresh and new, but it's still familiar. Definitely. You know, I have some ideas with like some snake print and some silk. How okay. that, how that gonna work? <laughs> I got you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this next question is for Sarah. You work with the global team. So how do you take inspirations from other countries and put it into the brand? Or is that a part of the process? Oh yeah, yeah, it's totally a part of the process. Um, we're a split creation center, so a uh, big part of our team sits in Germany and then a portion of us sit in Portland. And our focus is definitely on North America since we're at the North American headquarters. But I mean, if you think about the running consumer, people all over the world run. So I think what's really cool about what we do is um, honing in on those different experiences. So like a runner that's running in New York through the streets is gonna be a lot different than a runner that's running in like the suburbs of, LA, but I think what we do is we take those different running experiences and we find the red thread so that we're able to connect people all over the world. Um, so I would say a lot of it starts with the consumer and their running experience and how we can kind of weave that together to make a more unified story and concept. That makes a lot of sense because we all have different experiences. Like I'm in New York. You guys are in Cali. So I'm, sure, yeah, Cali, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure like our whole, our experience in general, like in New York, like footwear is so essential because we are hitting the pavement all the time. It has to be able to battle different weather. So that's really important as far as the design and how it plays a role, no matter where you're at. Mm -hmm. So the next question is for Victoria. Tell us a little bit about your, your creative process. What does it look like? So it's actually not linear, you know, it's a little all over the place. I would say like as a designer, we're always looking at inspiration. And so for me, like I love documentaries. I love listening to a lot of interviews, especially people who I admire. I'm listening to artists. Like I, it's almost like producing music, essentially. Like as a producer, you're looking at samples and archives of like old beats, right? And then you're reinterpreting them to make new songs and to make new beats. So I think design is very similar like that. Like I think you need to know and be informed of the past to inform the future. So just, you know, understanding fashion from the past, just looking at different things that can inspire you, you know, even going to thrift stores is super helpful. So just, it's not linear, but just looking at, yup. <laughs> you are just always looking at different things because you just never know how it can inspire one project or a project in the future. You said thrift, I was like, yes, girl. <laughs> <That's me. laughs> all, all over, okay. So this next question is for all of you guys. So how are you defining creativity in this current stage of your life in the current climate? So I think it's twofold. So creativity is super fluid for me. You know, like I came into this industry as a color material designer, which I absolutely love. And I get to apply color material and product, but I also love to apply color material in space and places. So, you know, even for me, like expanding into interior design and creative direction, you know, I think it's super dope that I can take creativity in one area of my life and apply it to a different area to just inspire me and push me as a designer. Um, unfortunately, with COVID-19, which is, you know, absolutely tragic, I do think it's forced me to just, like, rest and reset. And I think in this time, spending indoors, that, you know, more than enough time, I'm using this time to really study my craft. So, you know, doing a lot of reading, again, watching a lot of documentaries, studying people that I love, just to continue to build you know, who I am as a designer. And I think, you know, as creatives, we feel like we always have to put out output, right? And that's how we define creativity. But I think being creative also means resting. You know, you always wanna work from a place of flow, you know, not thinking like, oh my gosh, I feel so drained. Like, what am I gonna do? So I think it's using this time to really like, you know, steady rest and just be inspired. Yeah, I think that you nailed it when you said fluid. Um, creative, creativity has definitely been, um, unpredictable even at times like it's forced me to figure out new ways um to problem solve and design like i've used my kitchen wall as a pinup board because i'm used to pinning things all over the office and having things on hand um and i've even gotten into cooking like 
80% of the rest of the social media population, which I was never into before, uh, are very much unpredictable. Um, but I think even, again, echoing what Vic said, like the importance of taking breaks and taking time away is just as important as staying focused and putting in the time. Because I think as creatives, it can already be hard to turn the creativity on and off because you can't always control when the ideas are flowing. Um, so I think the more that I'm personally able to like take breaks and then dedicate certain segments of time where I'm feeling really fresh and really creative to um, putting pen to paper is how I've been handling everything. Yeah, I would agree to that. And I think for, for our team specifically, you know, we're really having to find new creative ways of just even working together. You know, we're, we're so used to holding a physical product and being all in the room to be able to look at it. So it's, we're having to find new creative tools and ways of sharing, which has been, you know, a unique challenge for us, um, as well as like, you know, continuing to get other inspiration and, you know, looking at the new blogs and articles coming in. But I think, you know, also going back to touching on Vic's point is that I feel like almost every morning it's like so much anxiety is built up of like rereading how many new articles there are about COVID and reading about, you know, what are the new trends that are forecasting and how many languages have you learned over the past two days? You know, it, it, it's almost so much pressure that it actually is nice to take a step back and I think, you know, I reflect on last year, I, I went to the factory to China four times and we had insane travel and work schedules and actually having a time to be home and be able to do the things that I miss doing, like cooking or just working out more regularly has been, it's, it's been kind of nice, you know, unfortunate about the whole situation, of course, but it is nice to, you know, take a little bit more time to reconnect with friends, family and ourselves as well. You guys made so many great points. And it's like, I think like back to being creative, like like Sarah said, like it's sporadic, it comes and it goes. And just allowing yourself to feel what you need to feel, the quicker you succumb to that, the quicker you can get over it and then go be productive. You see all these articles and all these Instagram posts about this is what you should do, be productive, be productive, be productive, when just being still is productive for your mental health. So I think that's really important for us, especially as creatives. Like we'll, we'll never have like this much of a break, hopefully ever again. So we really should take advantage of it and use it for more self-care and wellness. All right, so keeping it moving. Next up for Kelsey. Okay, so we know you've worked in many different offices. You were in Portland, you were at the Brooklyn Creator Forum in New York, and now you're in the LA office. So how has work been different? Um, I think one of the biggest things, you know, I think, you know, especially being in New York and all over the place as well, is that just being able to see what the culture is like in each of the cities. You know, the culture, the sport, the lifestyle, everything is so different. So that's been really awesome um, to just like go back and forth and see and compare. Um, but the, the really cool thing I think has been being able to meet people from across the brand in so many different countries and just make friends and see how different people work creatively. I think it's been cool to get to see how not just footwear, but apparel, graphics, color materials, creative direction, how everybody has kind of a different um, process of how they work. So that's been pretty awesome to see across multiple different um, of the different offices. So yeah, I'm gonna put you on the spot right now. So what was your favorite office? <laughs> Ooh, um, currently in LA, we've had a lot of different offices moving. So in terms of being in a stable office and just such a new culture, I, I think you know being in Brooklyn was pretty awesome. <laughs> I, I've never been to New York before in my life until I got asked to come um, check it out for six weeks. And then I ended up being there for almost two years. Um, but yeah, New York definitely grew you into the streets very quickly. And that was something I had to learn and adapt to uh, very quickly. But yeah, they're all really awesome um, offices and have been super fortunate to work with a lot of great people across all the teams. This next question is for everyone. So what's the best advice you receive from a teammate or someone you admire? Oh, so my advice was from Liz Callow. She's one of my favorite ladies at Adidas. And she's always telling me just my instinct. And it's so crazy because I invited her to come to this panel. And that's like one of the first things she says. And I think like as a woman, as a black woman, you know, sometimes there's not many of me, many of us in the room. And so sometimes like I can second guess my ideas or feel like, oh, is this the right thing to say? And she reminds me literally every time, like, 
trust your instinct, like exercise your discernment. So, and that's kind of carried me on throughout my career. Love it. Um, one of the most memorable pieces of advice I received from an old manager, and I'm finding myself constantly reminding myself of this, um, because I think sometimes we can be very protective of our ideas or feel like, oh, it's not ready, I don't want to share it, or like, oh, I'm nervous to share it, like what if somebody else like feels it or adopts it or changes it, but um, what he said was that the more open you are and the more you share and give up your ideas, then you make space for new ideas to come in, which I thought was really amazing. I never really heard of it that way, but once he said it, I was like, oh, yeah, that makes so much sense. So I found myself sometimes when I'm feeling creatively block, blocked or um, like, uh, yeah, I just need to move forward. I hand those ideas over or I share them with others. And sometimes people end up bringing them to even cooler solutions, which is always great to see. Yeah, for me, I would say the best advice I've received is kind of have fun with it. I think a lot of times with really tight deadlines and a lot of pressure and stress from you know, all the different people we're collaborating with to the deadlines of when it needs to come out to market. I think it's always good to step back and realize that, you know, we got into this because we're doing sneakers because we love it. And it's not, it's not life or death all the time. You know, there's obviously people out there working on the line that are saving lives like in the hospitals. But to me, it's really about just still remembering to have fun with it and that we're in this creative industry to produce something that's going to create something that, you know, somebody's going to take and enjoy. So it's always thinking about the consumer and having fun. Perfect. This next question is for all you guys as well. What advice would you give people who are interested in working in the sportswear industry as a designer? I think reaching out to people who you admire, like if you love their work, um, just reaching them out, reaching out to them. I think, you know, for me, I didn't get here on my own. Like someone was willing to take the chance on me and I'm still willing to do that on someone else, for someone else. Um, I think just being open to location, like a lot of these companies are based in Massachusetts or Oregon. And so being willing to relocate, I think that's super important. And now with like social media and like YouTube, like there's so many things where you can like honestly teach yourselves, right? And so just staying up to date on your skill set, reaching out to people, um, just being willing to relocate would be my feedback. Yeah, I think kind of what Vic said, I was lucky to have mentors along the way that helped me get to where I am. So I would encourage people to seek others out. Um, and like most likely, just like Vic said, uh, people are willing to help you out as well and share their experiences and give advice or review portfolios. Um, and then also just don't be afraid to really celebrate who you are and focus on your strengths and um, emphasize that because I think a lot of times you can feel like you have to mold yourself to everything you see out there. But I'll say there's like nothing more refreshing than um, seeing somebody stand out because they're really celebrating what's unique about them. So I would say definitely play up you. Absolutely. And I'd say going off of what Sarah said, sometimes, you know, if, if people want to just get into sneakers, they think that their portfolio should only have sketches of sneakers, but it's actually really cool for us to see the thought process behind other projects when we're reviewing, you know, up and coming designers. Like what piece of furniture did you make? What piece of apparel did you make? Do you have a vast background of it's more so about the thinking process versus like how beautiful is your sketch because you know there's a lot of people that can sketch amazing um, sneakers out there but really when it gets down to it it's uh, the, the thought process that goes behind it especially when you're making something that needs to functionally work on a body great answers guys so we're on to our last question before we hop into the q a so what are some positive creative quarantine tips you guys can share? How have you been staying motivated and inspired during this crazy time? For me, it's putting myself on a schedule. Like I have to be on a schedule or like the day would just go like ahead of me. And so for me, it's like waking up, doing my devotion, going on a run, working, taking lunch break. Like I think those things are still important. It's really teaching me discipline. Um, I think sometimes a lot of us rely on being in an office to have discipline, but I think just putting myself on a schedule has been really helpful for me. Uh, for me, it's been dedicating time to like really disconnect and take breaks. And some days when we're lucky enough to have sunshine in Portland, that's like taking a walk outside for a while. It's like riding a bike 
Um, sometimes I just listen to music and lay on my bed for a while. Um, but just try to step away from work since everything is happening in like my little apartment. Um, it's definitely been helpful to disconnect um, and even find and uh, like welcome random outlets of creativity. Like I bought a friendship bracelet making kit, which is super random, but <laughs> I had to dive into that one of my work. <laughs> so, yeah, I welcome, welcome it. <laughs> Um, I would say, you know, similar to Sarah, it's about being able to disconnect a little bit because I think, you know, especially being in LA, you have your almost hour commute to work and your almost hour commute back home. And so you have kind of that time to de-stress or listen to a podcast or listen to something without other distractions. But when I go from my kitchen to my living room after my work is over, <laughs> like it's hard to take a step away from all of that. And, you know, I think a lot of our teammates know that you know, you're doing nothing else, so you should be able to answer texts or emails at all times, but it's like okay to take a step back and go for a run or go for a walk and um, yeah, really just be able to de-stress and have that at least hour break in between work and then just continue on at home. So Sarah mentioned friendship white bracelets. <laughs> that was so funny, but so dope and just random. <laughs> Victoria and Kelsey, have you guys picked up any like new skills or decided to like you know, teach yourself French or anything. <laughs> um, honestly, just watching a lot. I love documentaries, and like, it's so interesting. Like, I feel like TV is such a leisure thing to do. So for me, I think that's why I like documentaries so much. It's like I feel like I'm watching TV, but I'm like being educated. Um, like last night, I watched like Iris April. So for me, it's just like doing the things that I haven't had time to do, <laughs> which has been um, helpful. I've been reading a lot, which I haven't had time to read in LA. I used to live in New York, and I would read on my commutes in New York. But I, since in LA, I'm always in traffic. Um, that's been, that's been good. Yeah, I'd say for me, definitely just picking up cooking again. Like I love food and I miss being able to go out to restaurants and I used to cook all the time, but with our, our crazy schedule and the commuting in LA, you get home and you're just absolutely exhausted and you don't have the energy to do that. Um, but now just, it's kind of something that we look forward to on the weekends. It's like, all right, what, what challenge are we going to do this weekend and what are we going to make? And to me, that's, that's been my creative outlook for sure. Well, for me, you know, I've been honing in on my juggling skills, you know, <laughs> TikTok, I, I be juggling. <laughs> and I'm just like, like you said, um, Victoria, like reading more, watching more documentaries, just like educating yourself in areas that probably might be able to help you better as a creator. That's kind of like what I've been really doing now. And having a schedule has been super helpful as well. So we do have some questions pouring in from the chat. All right, so question one, happy Earth Day, by the way, if you guys didn't know it's Earth Day. Sustainability is such a huge question and you know, we're so concerned about our climate. What steps are you guys taking to make sure that um, the sneakers and footwear that you're designing is more sustainable? I'll start off with Victoria because you are a materials designer. What type of materials are you guys using that are sustainable? Yeah, so for us, it's like looking at a lot of recycled materials and thinking about like how we can use those to help with sustainability. I also think when, you know, designing footwear, thinking about processes. I remember the first time I went to China and I went on a factory visit and I was like, oh my goodness, like my tech pack is like causing like this much delay in an assembly line. And so I think just understanding like, okay, how can I be more efficient with designs? Like what are suggestions I can make, you know, even just outside of materials, but thinking also about construction. Yeah, I think definitely materials for sure. Um, from a design perspective, it can be even like looking at something like pattern efficiency, which measures how much waste is getting thrown away after your pattern is cut. Um, so there are ways that you can engineer the pattern to even reduce the amount of waste that you're using, which is really interesting. Um, and then again, yeah, working with color materials as well, because sometimes we want to do things and there isn't a recycled material option with that. So it's going back to the factory and saying, is it possible to develop this so that it's more um, environmentally preferred? Um, and then we work and do a lot of development with our developers in the factory as well. Yeah, I'd say, you know, definitely looking at all pushing for new sustainable um, materials, such as like recycled content and yarns. And it's also, you know, what the, the other girls have been saying is about what's inside the shoe. And I think the more you can cut down the amount of steps and processes, there's less waste. And 
for, for every shoe, there's different components on the inside that maybe a lot of consumers don't actually see, but each of those little components adds to your footprint. So if you can use a recycled content for like the heel counter or in the toe, and all these little things make a huge difference when you're you're creating thousands to millions of shoes. Um, and then I'd say for us, we're also definitely looking at packaging and how do we reduce on the amount of waste there because it's not just about the product, but it's about the full process there. So, all right. So next question from Alan. He says, "What stigma if any do women sneakerheads have to shed in order to be seen as equals you all are?" Do we have any stigmas that we have to deal with? I think it's just men, okay? <laughs> like, they need to move over and make some room for us, okay? <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys think? Should I start? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think the biggest thing in general, I think just, I mean, as a woman, I think just bringing your full self to work. I feel like sometimes we have to go into the office and like, overcompensate, you know, because we may be like one or two females on the team, right? And feeling like, oh, we have to do these things. We have to do these activities to like feel included. But I think sometimes it's like being yourself, you know, like, you know, speaking up, if you're not okay with something, like address it, you know, there's certain ways to go about it. But I think sometimes feeling like you just always have to overcompensate or always prove yourself, but just reminding, like reminding yourself that like, you know, you're here, you're here at Adidas, you're here in your workplace. Like obviously you're here because you're talented and that's enough. You know, I think a lot of times like, we're just always looking for validation to compare ourselves with our coworkers or our colleagues. And it's like, no, like, you know, just be yourself on your work, um, be confident because that comes within, from within. Yeah, I think even on that topic of like confidence, sometimes um, your way of doing these things isn't gonna be the same as everybody else. So I think it's about finding those environments, those spaces, those people that make you feel really confident and comfortable and really utilizing that to um, have your voice heard if needed. Absolutely, and I think for us even, you know, we stay connected as designers, like younger female designers within the brand. And, you know, if there's something that maybe we're confused about or something like we can talk about it as well. So staying connected and having people to chat through in those, those situations. But I think it's also just, you know, continuing to push that it doesn't matter what, you know, race, gender you are, it just, show and prove your work and make sure that if you hear other people, you know, in the same situation that you were in five, 10 years ago, make sure to mentor them and help them grow so that they can be at the table with you as well. Yeah, I think that's really important. Just paving it forward because like you guys mentioned, like there's not a lot of women in this industry. So we really have to you support one another and bring each other up and continue to mm -hmm. rise. Thank you guys. So next question is from Tatiana. She asked, if you are not in college anymore, but have a passion for sneaker design or any areas in the sneaker industry, how are you able to get those internships that college students will receive? So I will say with most brands, I know particularly with Adidas, you have to either have graduated within one year to be able to intern or get college credit. Like, So there's a lot of stipulations on that. But I will say, like, you know, freelance is also a good opportunity to get your foot in the door. Freelance, um, possibly apprenticeship, depending on when you graduated. Um, and just working as a contractor, I think those opportunities are super helpful because you're still learning, you're getting hands-on experience. And then from being a freelancer, like going in internally, you know, you never know who you can meet through those opportunities. But I will say, and I get it, like, you know, when you're applying for jobs, it's like, you have to have, you always have to have experience. You're like, how am I gonna get experience if no one hires me? Right. <laughs> We're the catch 22, right? And I think, you know, I will say this too, like a lot of times, like, we're always waiting for someone to give us an opportunity, but sometimes you have to create your own opportunity. Like, it may not come today, it may not come tomorrow, but like, if you have the resources and you have the talents and the skills, like, put those things out. Like, I'm telling you, like, someone's gonna see your work, someone's gonna like look at your and be like, yo, this is dope. Like, how can we collaborate? How can we work together? Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, also, just don't wait. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even to continue on that, I think sometimes even smaller brands will be willing to work with. Um, anybody that reaches out to them, I think it's not even always about like what's being posted and people that are asking for interns or posting jobs, but sometimes they're willing to work with um, anybody and help you along and mentor you or apprentice you, like Vic said. Um, I think sometimes it is taking the initiative and like firing off emails or DMing people that you admire, reaching out to brands um, to let them know that you're interested and you want to learn. I think having that eagerness to learn um, is huge. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's it's been cool actually to see, you know, on, on social media, some of the people are going into their trash and creating a shoe out of what they have at home. You know, I think a lot of people are like, I don't have, you know, a full stitching line or a maker lab or a factory to create samples for me, but it's about creating and using what you have around you. And then I think it's also continuing the development like I spoke on previously. It's not just about the beautiful sketch or you made an amazing mock-up, but if you can put something together that captures all your ideas and the thought process and maybe share that as well, you know, then people are really can see how you want to push beyond just being somebody that's sketching. Because that's really it takes another step to become a footwear designer in that sense. Okay. All right, next up we have a question from Samira. She asks, do you design specifically for the US or do you design differently for different global markets? Or does it depend on the project? So for me in particular, it depends on the project. I'm I focus on US product essentially, but again, we are a global brand, so we are designing for everyone. But it does depend on the project and who your consumer is. Like I will say, like the consumer in the US could be very different from the consumer in Europe or wherever the case may be. And so I think just thinking about who the consumer is in mind, you know, especially if it pertains to sport or if it pertains to style, um, it's it can be very driven by um, location. Yeah, same with us in running. Um, even though we're a global team as well, and I'm on the team that sits in North America, it really depends on who we're designing for. Um, and sometimes, like, depending on where that location is, that shoe will get adopted in, like, totally globally. But sometimes we do get briefs that are, like, region-specific instead of global. But, yeah, like Vic said, it really just depends on who the consumer is you're designing for. Yeah, and, and for us, we're definitely looking at the bigger global scale, um, obviously depending on what partner we're working with at the time, but the idea is definitely to go global with all of our products as well. All right, next question is from Ali. She asks, are there any female icons or mentors you admire? Yeah, so actually um, her name is Cherise Thornhill. Um, I actually met her at Pencil. Um, this is actually when I want to be a footwear designer. And she came in, um, super sweet lady, and was telling me about my work. And she was like, oh, girl, you need to do da 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 But like, she gave me like correction in such a loving way. And I think it just goes to the importance of mentorship. And even now to this day, like I was just on a call with her this morning, you know? And I think, you know, sometimes you need to talk to your mentors every single day or check in every single month. But I think they're just there as ones we can learn from like, their experience, they don't make the same mistakes. And I think, you know, it just goes to show that like no one knows it all, but everyone's still figuring it out, you know? And I think just being open to learning from people and their experiences, but she, she's super dope, she's super helpful. Um, I've learned a lot from her. Um, and there's some other, like Liz Callow at Adidas, like she's literally like everyone's work mom, <laughs> so sweet. And I know that if I ever have an issue or I don't know how to communicate something or I'm like, how do I go about this? She's like, you know, my, my go-to person. I was also going to echo Liz Callow. She is amazing. She is like everybody's work mom. Um, I think outside of like the workplace as well, I consider my girlfriend some of like the most inspirational women in my life. And we're constantly in group messages, in DM messages on Insta, um, just bouncing ideas back and forth, sharing trends, um, like asking for advice, presenting projects and getting their feedback asking them how they would handle certain situations. Um, it's a super safe space. It's a super inspiring space. So um, a lot of my creative friends are some of my best friends. And they're some of the women that I admire and get a lot of my advice from. Absolutely. Um, I'd say, you know, definitely friend group of sharing amongst all our designers, just seeing, you know, all the crazy things that everyone's paying attention to. Um, for me, specifically within work currently, you know, we have our one of our head developers, Michelle, she's like badass developer and she leads the whole operations team. And you know, I know Vic and Sarah have also worked with her, but it's it's pretty insane to see how you know someone at that, that level can keep their composure, especially looking at you know all the things that we're doing on a day to day and being able to manage a team. You know? So anytime I can see that type of leadership, it's also like really awesome to to witness at work. You guys sound like you have such amazing women to look up to and around you at Adidas. That's a that's such a blessing because a lot of people just don't have that. What is something that you guys look for when like what are some advice when if you're looking for a mentor? What are some things that you might look for or like how do you approach somebody to be a mentor? 
You know, it's super interesting because I think that, no, one, not everyone's actually available to mentor. Like people, like honestly, people are busy. Um, but I think it depends also how you approach it. Um, and I also think mentorship should be two way. I think a lot of times people think like, I need to get something from them. But I also think like, what can you also give them? Like, how can you help them? Like, what can they also learn from you too? Um, and I think depending on the cadency of like the relationship, like asking them in person, like, hey, I think you're super dope. I love what you're doing. I've been following your work. I would love to for you to mentor me, you know? And I think it also depends on proximity. Like if this person is across the country, you know, it may be more challenging. Um, and I say that to live in the same state or work at the same job, but you know, just thinking about proximity before you ask them and just to see like, hey, maybe this may not be a best fit, you know? And I think, you know, you can still have a relationship with that person even if they're not your mentor too. So I also tell people like, if this person can't mentor you, don't be discouraged, you know, like they can still be a resource to you, maybe not in the way that you want them to be, but they're still there to help you. Yeah, absolutely. I think also being clear on what it is you want to get out of it. It absolutely is a two way street. So I think as open as you can be um, with whomever you're reaching out to, whoever you want, that mentorship with, then um, ideally they'll be open as well with how much they're able to give to that relationship. And then they'll probably be surprised, honestly, at how much they're actually learning and growing as well. Because it definitely is um, a relationship where both people are learning and growing together. So I think being open about what you want and how you want to grow and what you want to learn um, is, is huge and really helps that other person. Absolutely. And I, I think that it doesn't always have to be a super formal or it's a sit down or it's like a Zoom call or an email, you know, I think the more personal and casual you can keep it, it could be, you know, a coffee chat to catch up with somebody. And, you know, the more you share your stories and hear their stories, it's, it's something about learning about their past and how they got to where they are and something that you can implement some of like their advice there versus it always having to be, you know, extremely like business formal. Mm -hmm. All right, so this next question is from Nicole. She asks, how do you maintain your voice as a designer in such a collaborative environment? Is that important? You know, it, it, it is. It's so interesting because I think sometimes when you go into me, you assume that you always have to be the last person in the room and talk. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, I'm very much, a, like, I work with both of these ladies on different teams, and I'm very much a listener. Like, I'm the person in the room who's, like, listening to everything. And then after me, I'm like, okay. X, Y, and Z happen, X, Y, and Z happen, right? Because I was actually listening to listen, not listening to respond. Um, and so I think I will say like, you know, learning how to use your voice and exerting your voice in the best way possible, just also understand like, you know, the circumstances or the environment. Um, again, not overcompensating because you feel like you have to because you're a woman, but just owning it, um, being confident in it, but also just making sure that if you are like holding your voice or you have something to contribute, like it is something of value and not just talking for the sake of talking. Yeah, yeah, totally. I think setting the stage for where you feel most comfortable to share um, is key. And then also making sure that you have a point of view and not just talking to talk like Victoria emphasized as well. Um, I think having a point of view is huge. And then being able to share that in a space where you feel comfortable means that you'll be able to get your ideas across um, as clearly as, as you want to. Absolutely. And I think it's also, you know, it's not just about the one meeting or presentation you have, but, it, you know, a shoe goes through so many iterations and changes and through the hands of so many different people um, at the factory and sample room. So the closer you are to stay with the product, um, you don't have to be the last one in the room, but you can make sure that your ideas, your team's ideas, all those things are continuing to stay with the product through the, the full journey. All right, so next question is, how do you stay up to date with trends and cultural insights and with what cadency? Honestly, my group chat. <laughs> like literally, I think it's dope. Like I have friends who work in the sneaker industry, but I also have friends who are doing amazing things that have absolutely nothing to do with shoes. But like they're super involved in like culture, um, music, art, entertainment, all those things. And I think, you know, we have common dialogue. And so they're like, oh my gosh, Victoria, do you see this? Or this is happening or this is happening, right? I think that's super helpful. Of course, you have like your trend style sites, like the WDSN, but like everyone's also going there. And so I feel like it's good to be educated on what's happening universally. But if you're just taking the same thing that everyone's looking at, you're also all going to be designing the same thing. Um, so, I mean, social media is great, but again, everyone's going to social media. 
So I think it's important to be educated of what's going on. But I think for me personally, it's like looking at a lot of things that have happened in the past um, because they always reoccur again over and over again. Like they say, fashion repeats itself. Um, so just think about how the past, again, informs the future. Yeah, I think I can get really tired of just looking online and um, Pinterest and Tumblr and all of that. So I collect a ton of magazines, both like current magazines, but then I also look through old magazines that I've kept for the last like 10 to 15 years that'll spark ideas that'll be super random, not necessarily something that seems like it would be on trend, but maybe I can filter that through um, this season's trend lens and it'll get me to a new space. Um, I'm also really fortunate to have two siblings that are still in college that keep me young and relevant. So a lot of times I will outsource questions. <laughs> Yeah, I'd say the same thing. I think, you know, sometimes people assume that you're always looking at fashion and trend blogs, which A, can be extremely exhausting, and B, you know, what like what Vic said, if you're only looking at those, which is everyone else's, you are all going to be doing the same thing. So I actually don't really pay too, too much attention to that stuff because we're, what we're trying to do is be polarizing and create something different. So if we're all looking one way, that's how the product's going to come out. Um, but a lot of the the influence and inspiration, it's it's just coming from so many different aspects, and it's it's not just about fashion most of the time. You know, it can be a piece of apparel, or it can be architecture, or it can be you know so many different things that I think a lot of people think it's only about fashion. So it's about a much bigger picture for sure. I think that's really how you train yourself and grow as a creator is when you can just take anything and find inspiration in it, not just in the industry that you're in. I think that's really essential for growth. So this next question is for Lori and Vic, you mentioned fashion repeats itself. So do you guys ever take old concepts and make them new? Oh my gosh, yes. Like, I think you've had this like amazing archive. Like we've had so many like dope, 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 dope product, right? And it's just thinking about like, how can we make it new? Um, you know, it goes back to like going thrifting. Like you see all these things, you're looking at patterns and how things drape and you're like, oh, this is dope, let's bring it back. Um, so I like, the, I feel like the older, the further back you go, the more like cooler things that you find. Because <laughs> again, when you think about what everyone's doing now, sometimes it feels like everyone's kind of doing the same thing. Um, so just training your eye, I think it's just so, so important. Like training your eye and just looking at things of the past. Um, I think in running for us, it's, it's um, a little less like taking an old concept and making it new, but more so like how can you evolve it or improve upon something? Because sometimes not every design is gonna be like this totally new innovative concept. Sometimes it can be like a really small experience during a run that you wanna improve upon or maybe a small problem during that experience that nobody's addressed yet. Um, that doesn't seem like a big deal, but just solving that one little problem will make the experience a little bit better. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I think with us, we, we also have added as a massive archive of things to go back to and look at and reference. And sometimes, you know, a project, you may do hundreds of iterations on it and it just may not be ready yet. And it may not be ready to be released by whoever you're working with or, you know, how the brand is feeling, whatever the reason is. But, you know, maybe in six months or a year later, it is ready. So we go back and like re-pick up all the learnings that we had done and then take where we're at at that point you know, to reuse the new materials or the new processes and then continue the process of that project of where it was at. Okay. So I don't know about you guys, but I'm sure many people can relate that we get dressed from the sneakers up. So how does styling and how people put together outfits play a role in design? Shoes first. <laughs> that, that <time> is <laughs> yes. Like I had to say, it's like, ooh, like, Am I gonna wear these shoes today? Am I gonna wear these shoes today? Okay, that's gonna determine what I wear. And I think again, like when you think about for us as like color material designers, even footwear designers, like when we start to do merchandising exercises and working closely with our apparel designers, right? Like we're working with them at the same time where they're building out their range and we're building out our footwear. We're thinking, okay, let's start to see like how is this gonna look together? Is it gonna be a head to toe look? Because um, when people are buying stuff, people are not buying like outfits like literally head to toe. They're usually buying the shoes first and think, okay, these shoes are dope, so I'm gonna cop this shirt or like this sweatshirt. But I totally agree. I think personally, actually, I'm like outfit first and then shoes, which feels really backwards. 
but I'm a big like baggy silhouette person and I like only really wear basic white shoes. So it's really easy for me. But I think when, like, when designing running shoes, silhouette plays into it a lot. Um, thinking about a low cut, a mid cut, a high cut. You also have to think about, is there a tight that's being worn with that? What length and sock are people gonna be wearing with that? Of course that can vary as well, but um, definitely thinking about that head to toe look, but not uh, letting it hinder too much. Yeah, for me, it's on the environment and what I'm doing that day. If I'm going to be running around, you know, doing a million different things versus sitting at a desk and being super still, like that really plays a role into what I can dress myself in and what kicks I'm going to put on. Um, but I think, you know, that definitely the, the proportion in the stance is like the overall big thing that we really pay attention to. And sometimes it's about like getting rid of all the lines and the, the tiny little details on it, but it's looking at like the overall silhouette. Um, and that's how it's like really pushing, you know, what is the new um, the stance for sure. But um, I think environment plays a huge role, role into like how we style. Definitely. So like innovation is huge. It's, it's the future. So what is the future of footwear design? Where do you guys see it going? I think even like more like open source, right? Like I think before it was very much like, okay, you're the designer of the company. You guys are going to design the shoes, right? But I think a lot of it is like looking to our consumers um, because they're the ones who are buying the product, right? And so, you know, not just engaging with them at the end of the conversation, but bringing them a bit earlier and saying like, hey, like, you know, when you're buying maybe a running shoe, like, you know, what issues are you having? How can we accommodate and like design to make it better? You know, if it's styling, it's like, you know, where do you see trends are, trends are going? So for me, I think it's a lot more open source, um, especially with social media and having access to people, um, just bringing the consumer in earlier and earlier throughout the design process. Um, for me, it's actually been really interesting in quarantine, seeing how people have adapted their fitness. And even the more people you see walking outside, running outside, like there was an article I saw that was like, running the perfect sport for a pandemic, which was crazy. So it's, I think, thinking about what does that look like a in like a couple of years, which is the season that we're designing for. Um, but then also, I think there's a lot of untapped space in collaborations. So I think there's a lot of potential to collaborate with different brands, different people that we haven't really tapped into yet, which is it. Yeah, I think again, for us, it's really looking at environment and in the future, where are we going to be? You know, like right now, what we're used to on a day to day could be different. The world we're living in, you know, the spaces that we're in can be really different. So it's, we look at, at a bigger, broader picture of that. And it's like, am I going to be on a flat surface? Am I going to be in gravel? Am I going to be somewhere like where there's water everywhere? So the environment and the space of the future, like that's, that plays a huge role into it. All right. So last question from. Is there still a division between performance and style? Seems like all running brands are operating at this intersection. You know, I think more and more they're starting to like blend together. Um, like if someone's gonna buy a running shoe, they want it to look dope. You know, just if they were buying a shoe that wasn't like a functional running shoe, right? And I think more and more people are focused on style. You know, I think, yes, like form follows function for sure, right? But I think, you know, especially if I'm buying something personally, like I want it to look good, but I also want it to work, right? Mm -hmm. So I think more and more, I think before it was very, very segmented, but like, I think now we can't, we can't separate those two things. Yeah. I think my boss always says like, um, performance doesn't need to be ugly. I think sometimes with consumers, there's a misconception that if something looks too sleek or too beautiful, then it's style and it's not going to perform. But I think the more we're able to break down those barriers, the better, because at the end of the day, people do ultimately want to buy the coolest looking shoe and feel good in it. Yeah, and I think it also goes back to, you know, right now we're looking at what what is essential in our life. And if you can have one product that does it all versus have five of something that does, you know, every little thing for you, the more function you can get out of each product, I think is extremely important moving forward in the future. All right, well, thank you guys so much. That wraps up this panel. Once again, my name is Kia. You can find me on social at the Notorious KIA. Shout out to my amazing panelists, Victoria, Sarah, and Kelsey. Y'all know MVP, right? What's up, guys? Boye from the Future Party here. Thank you so much for watching the video. Hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. 
We've got some amazing content coming your way. Don't miss out. Like, subscribe, hit the bell for more notifications. Check out more on the Future Party in the description. All the things. Peace out for now. See you later.